um, the border between Scotland and, and the rest of the UK would become a hard border because in my analysis, I'm pretty sure Scotland would almost immediately rejoin the European Union. I think it's in their interest. <clears throat> they would probably adopt the euro. They're a wealthy country. Um, they don't have a problem. They would rejoin the uh, European Union. Whereupon that would become a hard border when you cross the M6 uh, up at Penrith <clears throat> and come down to Gretna Green. There'd be, you know, a hard border there. Is that to anyone's advantage? Obviously not. Um, I mean, something that I'm fascinated by is the history of intelligence. When I was doing my historical research as my PhD, partly at the LSE, you know, I studied a lot the history of intelligence during World War II um, and up to and during the Cold War. I mean, <clears throat> it's, uh, intelligence is fascinating. Now, British intelligence on the whole, up until recently, I thought was reasonably intelligent. What seems to have happened is British intelligence has, has dropped off the radar of what I call intelligence, and it seems to have been taken over by political forces that misuse it for their own ends. I think this was started under Blair and, and uh, Scarlett when they produced that dossier that proved Iraq had weapons of mass destruction, you know, and terrified Parliament into voting for the war in Iraq. This was, this was a catastrophe in terms of the integrity of British intelligence because it was fake. It was fake from beginning to end. And this is why I've written a book um, <clears throat> going into the history of all this, including the intelligence, behind the events of 9-11 in 2001 and the link between 2001 to 2003. There was a vital three-year period here when, when fake intelligence was produced to say that 9-11 was caused by Al-Qaeda alone, operating alone, when we know it wasn't now, with hindsight. And secondly, that somehow Saddam Hussein and Iraq had to pay for it. I mean, the most incredible distortion of reality was going on. As a historian, I'm watching this thing, it's like watching a pregnancy test, you know, the paper turning blue in front of your eyes. And it's not possible, you know, she's not pregnant, and yet it's turning. Unbelievable distortion of reality. So what we've now got is an intelligence service in Britain that, that <clears throat> fabricates truths, distorts reality, and then imposes them on the public through its control of the media. Uh, gosh, you know, it's, <laughs> it is actually quite unbelievable and scandalous. And if you know how these things operate, you can watch it. It's laughable. Um, so... What's going to happen after the independence of Scotland and, and the UK is that British intelligence, I mean, their, their, their morale is at rock bottom because they know they're feeding lies. You know, they're, they're, they're using dodgy sources, they're creating fake, fake stuff, and then they're promoting it. Like the Skripal incident, which, which Craig Murray and I both know was, was a con, you know. Um, it wasn't Russian activists trying to bomb... Uh, uh, kill people in, in the streets of Salisbury. It's just impossible. That was a few weeks before uh, the UK state bombed Syria. <clears throat> and um, again, on fake and, and provably false uh, pseudo-intelligence. So I feel strongly about this, this misuse of intelligence. So <clears throat> what would happen, and this is an intriguing question, with Scottish breakup and, and departure from the UK is um, there would have to be a whole new intelligence service created from scratch in Scotland and a lot of the people that currently work for UK intelligence would, would want to go and work for it uh, people of Scottish origin or people that sympathise with, with a Scottish state and I think it would be politically it would be more neutral it would be more like a non-aligned country. It would be more like a Scandinavian country. It might join the Nordic Alliance of Scandinavian states. Um, and it would, um, you know, it would, I think, have a, have a genuinely independent and intelligent intelligence service. This would cause havoc, I mean, in, in normal UK intelligence circles. Um, so that, that would be a conflict as a result of the you know, of Brexit and then independence. Um, my concern is simply that we find truth in, in current affairs, that if I um, ask a politician, you know, X, Y, Z, they tell me a truthful answer. 
And if I'm a politician and I ask an intelligence agent, X, Y, Z, they tell me a truthful answer. You know, I'm a great believer in, in um, the metaphysics of truth. And Gandhi said that satya, truth, is the only thing that can bring peace back to this world. This world is suffering from lies. Zoroaster, another great sage, said the same in his ancient times. He saw it intuitively. Evil is caused by drudge, the lie. And it can only be set right with peace and truth. And the, uh, the Soshans or the Seashant is the spiritual teacher that can bring that back. Uh, which is why I'm trying to get the collective Seashant of the planet re-energized so that we get an era of truth again, Sat Yuga returns. At the moment we've got this ridiculous Kali Yuga going on. I think that if Scotland became independent, um, there would be these tremendous conflicts break out and uh, the British, the rest of the British would, would, you know, as I say, fight over oil, fight over intelligence, they'd fight over who owns which bits of the army and the economic wars would be horrendous as well. Um, you know, there'd be, there's already sabre rattling about, you know, if Scotland is forced out of the European Union, they're demanding that they don't lose out financially. Well, you know, I can't see that going down very well in Whitehall. They'll fight that. It's going to be chaos. The only solution, if Brexit is pushed down the throats of the Scots, in spite of the costs, the advantage will be in, in independence for them. And I can say, you know, hand on heart, that that is what will happen. They will go for it. And I would vote for it too, because the misbehaviour of the UK state following this 2016 referendum uh, Brexit result is so, so horrendous that somebody has to stop them. And that can only be the Scots. OK, so um, <clears throat> how can it be stopped? What can be done? Because... At the moment, it's a sort of, uh, you know, a posse of, of um, you know, half-wits um, leading a kind of a race to, to self-extinction. Well, I think all um, moderate and intelligent and, and ethically trained and sensible MPs in Parliament, and there are actually a majority from all parties, uh, the Liberal Democrats, the Labour, <coughs> the SNP, all the parties, um, and including moderate conservatives, should come together and, and vote down Brexit. They should bring together a resolution that insists on a second referendum. I think there's a majority in the House for that. Certainly to postpone Article 50 and to suspend this looming date, which is a fantasy cooked up by Theresa May in her delusional state. Um, it has to be stopped. And it has to be done by a progressive alliance of these various forces. Clyde Cymru is important. I've written to Sinn Féin. I've, I've requested they also send their MPs to Westminster just for a day or two, just to vote this through. As I said in my talk last week, the problem is, of course, that Sinn Féin and the Irish Unification um, Project almost want Brexit to go through. They have a vested interest in, in seeing it happen because they know they'll get a united Ireland as a result. I would say to them, you know, please don't take such a divisive position, although I completely understand why they're doing it, um, because of the extent they've suffered, the occupation and so on of their country by the British over centuries and the cruelty of what was done to them. I can understand. And um, you can say it's karmic payback time for, for the English people. Well, I'm going to come to that in the final uh, section of this brief talk. Um, but what I've said to them is, is if um, Brexit can be stopped and reversed, um, I think, you know, it would be much easier to organise for a, a referendum on a united island if we knew that all of the British Isles was staying within the European Union. I think at some point a, a second or a referendum should be put to the people of Northern Ireland if they want to join. Republic. I think that should be done anyway. And if, if the whole of Britain and, and Ireland are staying in the EU, that reunification wouldn't be so traumatic. It would be a natural evolution. And I would say the same with Scottish independence referendum. If, if Brexit can be stopped and reversed in a second referendum, and it can be voted down, 
as I believe would happen. Eventually, I think Scotland might want to become independent anyway of, of the UK. And I think there's, there's, um, you know, there's, there's arguments in favour of that. But if, if the whole UK and Scotland are all remaining in the EU, then that would be much less painful than if there's going to be this hard border. So I think the option for, if I was an SNP member and wanted Scottish independence, I would say, no, hmm, that would be traumatic if, if England is outside the European Union and we are back in there. That would be a hard border with all kinds of legal nightmares. I think much more sensible is keep the UK together, stop Brexit, and then go for our independence later, both in Ireland and, and Scotland, actually. So that's what I'm proposing. Um, <clears throat> now, um, yeah, I want to just say a bit about um, the karma of all this. I've talked about the history of, of Scotland. Um, what most English educated people don't realise, and, and uh, Welsh and, and so on, is, is the extent to which there are a legacy of bad karma between Scotland and England, which goes back a very long way. Um, I mean, it's not all one way, it's complex. The Anglo-Saxon peoples contributed to uh, early Scotland. Um, King Edwin founded Edinburgh, Edwinsburg, and um, uh, an Anglo-Saxon queen, Margaret, married into the Scottish royal family and founded Dunfermline Abbey and St Margaret's Chapel up on Edinburgh Castle. So the Anglo-Saxons, um, you know, did quite a lot for Scotland. The, the Scottish dialect of Scots is, is a derivative of early Anglo-Saxon. It's closer to Anglo-Saxon than modern English is. So a lot of Scots words in use in, in the lowlands part of Scotland are actually old Anglo-Saxon words. So it's ironic that um, you know, the Scots are also Anglo-Saxon, but, but of a, um, <clears throat> in a sense, even a more authentic um, descent than, than the English. But I think the, the, the cruelties that were done at the time of the William Wallace Rebellion that we've all seen in Braveheart and so on were real. The, the English were not, um, you know, coming as benevolent tourists in those days. They were conquering Scotland, or trying to, in a series of bloody encounters, which they eventually lost at Bannockburn. And Robert the Bruce and, and Wallace fought them off in a series of extraordinary encounters, um, and the Scots have never forgotten that they actually won those wars. They don't have to be under the English. They defeated them. Okay, so what then happened? Well, fast forward. There was a time of great creativity in Scotland under the Stuarts, the early Stuarts. There was a very strong Scottish Renaissance that most people don't learn about. Um, and there was a lot of toing and froing with France. The, the French monarchy and the Scottish monarchy intermarried quite a lot. And there was a lot of cultural uh, sharing. Um, <clears throat> if you go to Stirling Castle, a lot of the rooms and so on, a lot of the design was done by French architects who brought over French um, you know, influences and, and customs. And Scotland became a very sophisticated European country. Um, I'm interested, as you know, in esoteric history. And the Scots, <clears throat> at this time, imported a lot of advanced Kabbalistic ideas, um, Templar ideas had come in, um, and a lot of esoteric thinking going back to Raymond Lull and, and the great search for absolute unity of all, all being. This has been studied recently by a, a wonderful woman academic, Martha Keith Souchard, in her book Restoring the Templar Vision, where she talks about several chapters about the profundity of Scottish metaphysical thought in that early Renaissance period, where it had come from, what influences had, had it come through. And this is what gave rise to Scottish Freemasonry, which was non-operative. It was not learning how to build buildings. It was learning how to understand cosmology and understand the inner fabric of being. She argues, and I think she's right, that the fundamental roots of it were in the Kabbalah, which were the great mystical Jewish schools of, of Spain particularly, but also France. Here in France, the great... Talmudic scholars like Rashi and others in, in the Rhine region 
and in Troy had developed a, a, a profundity of, of scholarship around Jewish thought that fitted in with the Kabbalistic ideas that were bubbling away in Spain. And um, what Suchard has done is trace how these then grew into non-operative Freemasonry and some of the rituals and ceremonies. And I think she's right, that there was this incredibly rich intellectual cult culture, <clears throat> which also you can see in the architecture of places like Roslyn Chapel. And, um, you know, the Da Vinci Code is sort of right, but wrong. It's right in that these traditions of esoteric knowledge were transmitted north of the border of Scotland. And sometimes they missed England altogether. There were direct routes to Scotland. It had its independent access to European um, <clears throat> universalism, universal esotericism. It was also bound up with alchemy and the whole algebra of, of consciousness that alchemy was talking about. Now, <clears throat> what later happened, of course, is that, is that Elizabeth, who was a wise queen in her own right and um, a learned lady, she, she felt that she ought to bequeath the kingdom to, to the king of Scotland. Uh, James VI or James I and he was a highly intelligent man highly educated um, and I think a worthy successor um, he, was, he was Catholic he was the son of uh, Mary Queen of Scots a, a great Renaissance figure in her own right um, who tragically had been executed by Elizabeth I think it's one of the great stains on Elizabeth's character she should have properly investigated it the evidence seems to show that uh, Mary Queen of Scots was set up by, by um, you know, the, the, the spy system of Elizabethan uh, spy masters. Um, <clears throat> but, you know, I suspend judgment on that. But I still think that she, she shouldn't have been dabbling in, in, um, <clears throat> in those kind of things. It was tragic. I think if only Elizabeth and Mary had met, they would have probably got on. But anyway, I think Elizabeth felt guilty and so she, she said, look, I'll give the kingdom to, to her son, James. <clears throat> and I think he took it very seriously. He tried to be a good king. He, he was a friend of some extraordinary people. He knew Francis Bacon. He was a friend of William Shakespeare who helped carry his robe at his coronation, the, the young playwright. Um, and, you know, he was a sponsor of the King James Bible, which which incorporated a lot of the rabbinical knowledge of, of European intellectuals. Uh, they used the text of Rashi, for instance, his commentary on, on the whole Bible when they were translating afresh. And James was, was a patron of, of, of learning and scholarship. His vision was for a Europe at peace. He saw himself as a European monarch. He saw that God had given him this throne, this amazing throne called Great Britain, which he... He designed the first flag for, the Union Jack was his invention. This is an island of saints, he said. This is such an honour to be able to, to guide the destiny of this land. I want it to be a country of peace, is what he, what he said. And Inigo Jones painted um, the ceiling of the banqueting hall in Whitehall, which was commissioned by James, with a picture of King James um, and, and symbolising peace. The apotheosis of peace, it's called. He wanted nothing more than to see Europe at peace. Um, <clears throat> and for his kingdom to be at peace. Because don't forget that there had been incredible wars between England and Scotland up to that point. Border wars. Right up until almost the last whistle. Um, in, in the 1500s there was still fighting going on. A couple of Scottish kings had died. At Flodden and elsewhere. Um, <clears throat> because of these wars. Now James could celebrate the fact that his reign had brought peace between England and Scotland and Wales. Um, and, and he hoped for that in Europe as a whole. He wanted to go down in history as a great peacemaking king. This is why Francis Bacon called him the new Solomon, because he sponsored the arts, learning, scholarship, and science. And in his patronage of Francis Bacon, he wanted to see science put on the map. Um, and and proto-Freemasonry as well. His, his um, master of works, William Shaw, was both an operative Freemason but also a non-operative. Probably he was a great friend of James's Danish wife, who was from Scandinavia, 
James was a cosmopolitan European monarch. And he married his children. He tried to marry one to a Protestant and one to a Catholic. He thought this would be a way of telling Europe, look, stop your religious wars. We can be both Protestant and Catholic. We don't need to fight over this. I agree 100% with James. To be Protestant means to be protesting against injustice. I'm a protestant. To be Catholic means you look for universal truth, Catholic truth, in all the wisdom, now I would say, of the entire world, of all the world systems of thought, and all the branches of Christianity and so on. You look for the universal truth underlying them all. So, of course, we're all partly Catholic and partly Protestant. So this, this, this ridiculous wars that was going on in Europe between the two and have been going on in France, tragically, the Huguenots and Catholics had each other's throats. James had the intelligence to say, this is ridiculous, stop it now. Um, and and let's, let's look for the commonality, and, and let's also protest injustice where we find it. Um, unfortunately, James's views didn't prevail, and his daughter that he married um, to... Elector of the Palatinate, um, Frederick, <coughs> Elizabeth Stuart, um, was, was forced out. The, the Thirty Years' War began, in, in a sense, at one of her garden parties. You know, it was a nightmare. And, and this is something we should bear in mind. Often the thing we most fear is the thing that we attract into being. What James feared more than anything was a great religious war. He tried his best to prevent it. And what did he get? He got a huge, great religious war in Europe. And then after his death, not long after, he got an enormous civil war in Britain. Poor old James must have been, you know, kicking himself in the afterlife, thinking, what more could I have done to prevent this? And now, karmically, looking down, as it were, from heaven on us, I think what he's saying is, for God's sake, don't break up, you know, the, the, the Great Britain, which, which I brought into being in 1603. How, you know, how could you possibly even consider it? It'd be undoing the work that was launched in 1603 when, when he took over the crowns of Britain and, Ireland, uh, and, and uh, England, Wales and Scotland. He also sent, um, he tried to stabilise the situation of Northern Ireland and the, the Democratic Unionist Party that, that profess allegiance to the Union were planted, their descendants of planters that he sent from Scotland. Um, <clears throat> I think they ought to show more allegiance to James's vision, not Theresa May's vision. James's vision was for stability and peace in the whole of Europe and the whole of the United Kingdom. And um, <clears throat> by by colluding with the Theresa May Brexit fantasy and the hard right with the Tory party, the DUP are actually betraying James's legacy because they're, they are bringing about, as I've explained, the, the perpetual termination of the union between Britain and, and um, sorry, between England and Wales and Scotland. And they have to wake up and realise that, hang on, we're on the wrong side here. The DUP have to switch their votes against Brexit. And I hope to God, that some intelligent DUP people listen, and I'm speaking as Chair of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission for Britain and Ireland. You know, I'm neutral when it comes to Catholic versus Protestant in Ireland. I'm on everybody's side. I'm a Catholic Protestant. I'm in the, the Stuart tradition. And I'm, you know, interested in that esoteric search for universal wisdom that I've talked about. From that perspective, <clears throat> then, we have to stop Brexit. It's a total nightmare. Because it's going to break up this link between Scotland and the rest of the UK. Um, and as I said last week, it's going to lead to the um, severance of, of, of Northern Ireland as well. But in this talk, I'm concerned mostly about the Scottish dimension. And I hope I've explained why, if you're an English person listening to this talk, if you have any kind of residual thoughts that Brexit is a good idea... You, know, you seriously need to re-listen to this talk and, and, and look at a map. You know, Get out a map of Scotland. Get out a map of the UK. And, and look at the implications of complete Scottish independence for the survival of the UK. In, in, it, it won't happen. What's going to happen then if we fast forward? Brexit happens. Theresa May doesn't listen. Nobody makes her watch my videos. 
Um, <clears throat> she just goes on in her blinkered way uh, with, with the fanatics that are behind her, the Reese Moggs and people. Um, pushes through Brexit, end of March. Within a couple of weeks, within a month or two, the Scots are going to demand a second referendum. And I think the, the, the groundswell of opinion will so shift as the harm and the damage that's being done to the UK has, becomes apparent that they will gain their second referendum <coughs> and vote for independence. They will then rejoin the EU, and I think this will happen... Um, Nicola Sturgeon said she thought it would happen within five years. She's being deliberately cautious, like politicians. Uh, I think it'll happen within a year. And then um, all the kind of worst-case scenario of, of how to sort out Scottish and, and English relations are going to enact before our eyes. Now, I want to finish by looking at this thing from a, a Druid or a Christian, a, a bigger picture. I want to talk about theology here. Theresa May often bases her argument. She said, no, no, God told me to do this. What I'm doing with Brexit is because God told me. I'm sorry, that, <laughs> madam, but your theology is 100% false. I don't know what church you think you belong to or whether it's some kind of Christianity or satanic cult. I don't know what you're in. You know, if you're, if you're giving back up to satanic cult type people, that figures because that's the actions that you're undertaking at the moment. An authentic Anglican who's loyal to the, the, um, you know, the Stuart tradition and, and King James, who brought the King James Bible into being and so on, would, would, would look at what Brexit is offering with horror. They would say, nowhere in a million years am I going to be involved in and responsible for the breakup of this, this kingdom. You know, if you think that God had a plan for Britain, that we somehow are supposed to be on the side of the angels, that Columba and St. Patrick and... Dear old St. George from Palestine and, you know, all the other saints, St. Andrew from Scythia, that somehow our, our sacred little island is supposed to be part of God's plan on earth. Why would self-destruction and breaking it all up be part of that, you know? I'm sorry, there's no theology in Christendom that can justify it. Um... So, on the contrary, and, and so far as I know, the woman has never done a single day's theological study in her life. It's a fake, it's a fake uh, presentation that God is on her side. I'm sorry, there's no God in the universe. Apart from possibly Satan, and this was the point made by um, <clears throat> the EU quite well, you know, I think Satan described in the most diabolic sense of the destroyer, the one that wants to show uh, you know, chaos and confusion and fear. That God, if such a dark deity exists, then that definitely is on the side of Brexit. You know, let's break up this sacred little island. Let's let's sow fear, poverty, discord, you know, etc., etc. Doing a great job. But paganism, authentic paganism, which is which which doesn't have a devil figure. I'm writing a book about comparative diabology, so I'm a bit of an expert on the devil. Genuine paganism, Wicca, Druidry, and so on and not on the side of Brexit. I mean, some misguided souls, and I have a few friends in the pagan community who, who are misguided, unfortunately. Uh, you know, because there's no real pagan colleges where you can train, there's no degrees where you can do paganism and druidry and so on to a high level of sophistication. So that pick, picking stuff up from YouTube and different um, books and, and, and pagan authors, um, you know, gives you a distorted educational experience. So... You might think, no, Brexit, oh, it's great, you know, love it. British nationalism, way to go. <laughs> but unfortunately, my dear friends, it's not, as I hope I'm explaining. So look, the only theology worth having, and the, and the thing where we all agree is, is that love is preferable to hate and destruction. I mentioned this in my talks in Top Mess. I keep coming back to this theme. Love and unity is, is precious, you know, when you have a relationship, when, you, when you're in love with somebody, life becomes three-dimensional. The colour switch is turned on. When you're alone and, and feeling miserable and, and afraid of life, then, you know, life is pretty pointless. Do we really want to end up an island full of afraid, frightened people, full of very rich haves and, and the mass of the people have-nots? Do we want to live in a world, and in a country which is 
broken into parts where people are fighting each other. You know, no, sorry. I, I believe in a country based on love and confidence and openness, which is part of, um, you know, our precious heritage and, and the Christian tradition and all the other religious traditions of humanity, of which there are many flourishing in Britain now, um, you know, Buddhist and Hindu and Sikh and Muslim, the Sufi traditions and so on. We have some amazing spiritual centres in Britain and in Scotland. I've been to Samuelin, I've spoken at um, the Isle of Arran, the retreat centre there. I've spoken in uh, the Sufi centre Chisholm House, which is dedicated to the work of Ibn Arabi, one of the great Islamic Sufi saints, who also emphasised love and unity. These, these real realised sages will be looking at Brexit and just tearing their hair out in the afterlife, saying, what on earth? We love Britain. Why is it doing the self-destruction? <clears throat> well, I've tried to explain why and where it comes from. It comes from some very dark forces who are dabbling in, in, in that diabolic and, <clears throat> and destructive energy. The only uh, defence against that is love and prayer and, and study and true scholarship, authentic learning. Um, and so to look at this, that's kind of where I'm coming from, to, to look at this from a Druid perspective, we have to somehow realise the negative karma that Brexit embodies and say, look at it, you know, as I've tried to do at this talk. Ha, huh. no, I don't like that. I don't want to go into that future reality. Um, Thank you very much. You know, I've glimpsed that. It's like in the wonderful part of Herman Hesse's um, novel, I think it's The Journeys to the East or one of them, when, when you get these boxes you can, you can open and look into potential futures. Um, well, no, I don't want to open that one. I've glimpsed. Thank you. We should open the box that says love and unity and, and affirm each other's separate cultures. So Britain is a little microcosm. We, we have... So many rich textures there of, of Southall Sikhs and Stamford Hill Jews and, and um, you know, the, the people of Cornwall, the people of Northern Ireland, all their varieties, Protestant, Catholic and, and pagan and secular, you know, um, all the people of Scotland. Again, there are many different types of people in Scotland, many different subcultures. They're all amazing. We should be celebrating this as a microcosm for humanity and saying, look, guys, we, we glimpsed the abyss and now we've chosen love. This is a message we could then send out to places like Israel, Palestine, to places like poor old Mexico and the US who seem to want to start their wars again. Um, and all the other places that are in torment. We have to vote down hatred and fear and divisiveness and we have to vote up unity and love. I don't believe Israel and Palestine have to go on fighting each other for the rest of eternity. I want peace there in my lifetime. I want the Golden Gate opened in the eastern wall of the old city of Jerusalem and a peace tent on, on Temple Mount. In that sense, I've been true to that Templar heritage of the Scots and, and you know, the, the people of Troy, where the council was founded here in France, and Bernard of Clairvaux, who, who wrote the rule. You know, we want a kingdom of love, thank you very much. Um, and, and we want it now. <laughs> so we have to vote down the stupid Brexit nonsense. We have to do it with our politicians who are supposed to be listening to us, the people. I'm just speaking here on behalf of the people, saying we've, we've had enough. You know, there's dear old Madalena who's playing the guitar and singing songs, and, and there's many others, all, all of us in our own way. There's going to be a million people coming to march in London on, I think it's the 26th. Um, I had a dream, I'll just finish with this last thought. I had a dream last night, which I want to share, of um, talking to Thomas a Becket, the old Archbishop of Canterbury, um, who was, I think, the most important saint the English ever produced. And he was a great man, he was a scholar. He'd spent part of his life studying in, in